the leaves are turning here in North America once again, which means we're due for another entry in the Labatai system from Marshall Enterprises. This year they've they've graced us with Labatai de Deutsch Wagram. This is the massive battle in the uh, Franco-Austrian War of 1809 that more or less decided the campaign. And uh, the game is pretty massive as well. So I thought I'd start by taking a look at what comes in the box. So it's a lot of stuff. Starting from the left here, the year I have six standard Labatai scale maps. Big. There's actually a seventh map that covers some pieces of the battle that aren't represented on the standard maps. There's a lot of counters. Seven counter sheets to represent the armies from present plus a couple of the standard markers counter sheets. So a lot of French, a lot of Austrians. Typical La Bataille um, artwork for the Marshall guys. And of course they're double sided and standard half inch size. Now to help ease the burden of these massive armies, typical La Bataille fashion, they have the organization sheets. So you can see how the formations fit together. So the Austrian army here is divided into corps and divisions. Pretty large. And then we have the optional army of Inner Österreich here, which is Prince John's force that may or may not appear in time to help the Archduke Charles. And then the French have their forces. And actually, they're as much of a uh, coalition as the Austrians. So they have German, Italian, as well as the French forces present here. These are really helpful when you finally get all the pieces out to understand the relationships of the different forces and how they can maneuver and fight together. A couple of player aid cards for the combat tables. Uh, fire, melee, that expanded melee chart the Premier guys have. Time recorder, the sequence of play. And one last sheet to introduce you to the game. Notice there are no rules. There's no scenario write-ups. They're here. They're just presented in an electronic format. So you get to download them uh, in a format that may be useful to you. If not, you can print them out yourself. And that's a pretty massive couple, well, over 100 pages, I think, between the rules, the historical articles, and then the scenarios. And the only real problem that I have with the electronic-only rules is that they're in a format that isn't very conducive to my preferred tablet, or any tablet for that matter. So you have to have either a, a full-on desktop, laptop, computer around, or print the damn things out. Ultimately, you're probably best off printing the things out because if you can keep all of this paper and cardboard safe somewhere, you can probably keep the pieces of paper of the rules safe as well. I know from hard experience that plenty of digital formats go bad on me even when I'm trying to keep them safe. I'm going to get these maps set up so we can get a look at the scope of the battlefield represented here. Well, it's big. This is looking south to north with Vagram in the center there. All the way to the right and all the way to the left. I think this is about the same footprint as the Austerlitz map. I'm going for a little closer look here. I'm starting at the very far east of the map. This is south looking north, basically from the French lines. We have the Rusbach here with some crossing points. Uh, the town of Mark Graf Neusiedel on the left there. And then the heights behind 
which is where the Austrians had set up their position. I'm just going to go in real quick to look at that particular set of hexes. These hexes are Feldjagers. They are semi-permanent campsites. It's been a good six weeks or so since the Battle of Aspern Esseling, and the Austrians have kind of settled into their positions. So these are kind of unique to this battle and to this particular map. I guess we'll start our journey here, moving roughly west along the Rusbach. We'll have the very far right, which is where the Austrians are going to find the French trying to turn their left flank. Get closer to the center there, Bombersdorf, which was a point of contention. Certainly on the first day of battle as the French tried to make their way to contact. Keeping ourselves going along the rust back for a bit, there's the titular town, Bagram. And all of these steep slopes indicating that high ground behind the river that were uh, occupied by the Austrians. There's Otterclaw. Again, one of those very strongly contested locations. It really just looks like a little little village on the map. And as we go further west, the ground becomes much more open. There are some places that were certainly fought over here on the um, Austrian right, the French left. But the main battle was taking place further to the east. Now to the very far west and south of that main line, there was still um, some map here and a pretty interesting part of the battle that took place. So you have Cagran there and Brighton Lee. And those are kind of the jumping off points on the very far Austrian right for an attack on the French left. Not depicted on the maps in this game, are the crossings over the Danube um, from Lebeau Island that the French used to get across to the north side and you know take on this campaign. And the Austrians attempted attack on their right against the French left that could have severed the French from their crossing point. But Wagram itself doesn't include that part of the battlefield on this map. The map stops about right here and the part south towards the river are not depicted at this scale, but we do have a depiction of it. We have this map. This is called the Drive to the Bridges map, and it's kind of a area movement game within the game that allows you to simulate the effect of this Austrian attack on the main um, battle. The French had to really perform an interesting disengagement and pivot down to the left to try to stop this attack while maintaining their own in the central part of the battlefield. So there are some special rules where you play this game within a game during the uh, main battle, but you can also play it just by itself as its uh, standalone scenario. So this, you know, it does the job. Here's Gagren and Brighton Lee. Rosdorf is actually just to the, um, to the east of the line along the map, uh, the, the Valgren maps. So it represents the things that, the events that occurred. And I guess, oh, and of course, as for nestling there. And, and that gets the job done. But there is an option for those who have the martial title Aspirin and Essling, published a few years ago, where you can get those maps and mate them to the Valgren maps and then have the full field left, right, and center, and you can game the drive to the bridges on the normal um, up at high scale. Of course we want to see what that looks like. So here's the Astro Nestling maps. See the two villages are holdovers from the Vagra map, and then everything to the south is from the AE maps. So there's the Danube. Aspernestling, 
and the crossing points. Uh, so it adds a full, uh, let's say, two and a half maps. Full, one full AE map. Then there's a fair amount of overlap. So about a half of the other two AE maps. It's big. Just looking a little closer at after Nestling, the crossing point was right here. This was the bridge. That shouldn't be there now, really. Or at least it's not the one that was used. Probably be somewhere over here on the east side of the of the river. And you can just get some, you know, counters from some other game and make a, a little bridge there. So we take a little trip from just about the crossing point and get through the original Astro Nestling battlefield from May and then up towards the Austrian right wing. The amount of ground they have to cover to get all the way to the bridges. A good long way in a lot of map. This is the French Army of Germany. This is really the bulk of the French Army here. The strongest forces, the Guard, the Second Corps, Third Corps and Fourth Corps are kind of the largest, most potent formations. Lots of artillery in the Third and the Fourth Corps there. Now, it's kind of interesting, there are a couple of divisions, kind of ad hoc, of Fourth Battalion units in both the Second and Third Corps there. There's also some coalition flavor. There is a regiment of Portuguese infantry. There's also some cavalry in the Second Corps from Portugal. Here are the Baden infantry, as well as some artillery. And of course there's some um, Italian light infantry in the Second Corps there. Really large amount of um, cavalry also present here in the 4th and 3rd, even in the 2nd Corps. The Guard isn't that large, but still it has a very large artillery park, which of course was used to uh, great effect. Now the balance of the army here, this is the other uh, three divisions of the 4th Corps, and we have Eugene's Army of Italy here, 5th and the 6th Corps, with the Italian Guard. And then we kind of come into the rest of the army. Here's the 7th Corps, which is really the Bavarian contingent. It's kind of a powerful division. The 9th Corps is the Saxon army. They fought terribly for the Prussians, and now they're going to fight terribly for the French. And then the 11th Corps, this is um, Marmont's army. And then the very powerful cavalry reserve there. Very strong, heavy cavalry, the Dragoons and the Cuirassiers there. So a very big and relatively strong army, but it does have a few weak spots. The one last little detail to look at here, the 4th Corps. We have uh, the leaders here, and it was led by Marshal Messina. And we have two unmistakable counters for the Marshal here. They look a little different. Usually we see them with a zero for increments and a pretty large number for movement, 10 or 12 or something. And here we have three increments and seven movement, and then zero and two. And this is representing the, the injury the marshal suffered, but he still remained in command. And he had a special carriage rigged up, and that is represented by this counter. So it has seven movement points, much slower than normal representing him in the carriage, then another counter representing him out of the carriage, and very slow, only two movement points. And the three increments represent basically the amount of damage the carriage can take before it's eliminated, and he's reduced to being on foot here. Um, you don't want to really <laughs> test that, because each time there's any kind of uh, damage, there's of course also a risk of a leader 
casualty and you don't want to get the marshal killed. But still, he's able to move around some, much slower than normal. But uh, his ratings on the reverse side are the same, whether he's in the carriage or on foot. So it'll be interesting to see how he's able to move and lead his corps. And here's the mass of the Austrian army, the main force under uh, Archduke Charles. Divided into seven corps, an advanced guard and a reserve. There is a lot of artillery. Precious little cavalry spread throughout the main corps. Most of them are gathered into the reserve corps here. Lots of heavy cavalry and some light. There are a lot of large regiments. Some of those typical gigantic Austrian regiments. 32, 31 increments. They have decent firepower, both in the form of that artillery as well as their infantry, fire, and melee values. Of course, there's a whole lot of them. But their weakness kind of hides in plain sight. There are some of these land bear units sprinkled throughout each corps. And of course, they're poor. They don't have very good combat power and very poor morale. But a really great number of these line battalions, you know, the white clad or blue panted line battalions, actually have very sketchy morale as well. Some of them have it in the 20s, and that's pretty good. But quite a number drift up into the 30s. And that becomes quite a problem when you have morale levels start to kick in late in the game. They won't have very good staying power, in spite of their size and their combat power. Now on the surface, that might seem kind of unfair. This is the reformed Austrian army. They just beat the French a few weeks ago in a pretty major battle. So the soldiers must be feeling kind of good about themselves. But the same can't be said of the officers in charge. Charles basically has no idea what he's trying to accomplish at this point. His core leaders haven't really performed the way he would have expected or liked. So I think those poor morale ratings kind of reflect the state of the army in, as a whole, especially in how it's led at this point. So while these soldiers might be pretty good, their leadership isn't so good. And the last force here is the Army of Inner Austria. This is Archduke John's uh, force that was fighting basically in Italy. They got their hinds kicked. And this is a variant, a what if, is whether or not John can arrive in time to affect the battle. Now, th this army is, you know, really just a, a core, not especially large. It has, um, you know, a decent amount of artillery, not a lot of cavalry. It suffers from the same problems in that the morale isn't so great. And it has some of these um, weaker land bear units. Given the number of defeats they suffered up to this point in the campaign, I think I might expect their ratings to even be worse than they are. But they're largely in line with the rest of Charles's army. But uh, again, they may or may not appear off on the French right to uh, inflict uh, some kind of risk on the French late in the battle. So now, we just have to get all these things set up on the map. Take a look at how the game looks at the very beginning. So this is the setup for Scenario 8. This is the main battle for July the 6th, using the Astro Nestle maps. There are nine scenarios in all. Three for July 5th, two main battles for July 6th, and the balance for specific actions on July the 6th. Now this scenario eight begins at 7 a.m. So on the left there, the French left, we already see the advance of the Austrian 6th Corps. That's because the battle begins at 4 a.m. with the Austrians taking the initiative and launching attack, both on the left and the right. So apparently that attack is already completed, and we're going to pick it up 
right here with the French beginning their own attack on their right against the Austrian left. Taking a closer look starting on the far east, the left side of the Austrian line, see the advance guard holding the far left, moving towards the west, have the fourth corps holding the heights above uh, the rust back there, shifting further. They have to hold a pretty large space here. Notice how very thinly it's held. They have very little in the way of reserves. They're counting on the terrain and the artillery to hold on here. Shifting further to the west, Baumersdorf received the second corps. Again, covering a very large space. Getting over to Wagram, we see Carl there. And now moving into Belgard's first corps. Coming down off the heights there. They're occupying this space up to really the far right of the Austrian line here at Otterclaw. And that, that's the main line of resistance right there. Off a little further to the west, we'll have Lichtenstein's reserve, Grenadiers and the cavalry there. Now we're going to follow the line here, a very long way, to the right of the army. Far away from what constitutes the center and the reserve there, all the way over there, this is the third corps. which is going to begin their attack from this position around Cogren there. Quick hop, because I ran out of map space, table space. This is the far right of the Austrian attack, the Sixth Corps. See, they're already on their way towards uh, Aspern there in, the, in a little distance. And they're covered barely, by just a little bit of Vincent's division's uh, cavalry. And of course, Kolarat there on their left. Now taking it from the French point of view, I'll try to take the same journey. Starting here on the very far right of the, le of the French line, they have some cavalry holding the edges. And bearing in mind that the uh, Archduke John may be entering from this location, so possibly that cavalry may need to keep him at bay. Then we move into the Third Corps as they prepare their attack on the Austrians there. They're spread out. They're also very large divisions. The Marshal is actually right there with the artillery. And there's some reserve heavy cavalry right there as well. Back to the main line, we have the second corps to the left of the third corps. We we're just about opposite Baumersdorf there. There is Napoleon in the guard in reserve. Poor Ninth Corps remnants of Bernadotte and the Saxons are there, as well as some heavy cavalry of the reserve. The French are arrayed in depth here. Up in front here is um, Marmont's Eleventh Corps, and in front of him, taking a little jump, is Eugene's. Army of Italy with the 5th and 6th Corps. They are kind of due west of the 2nd Corps here. And they are opposite Otterclaw as well as Wagram. Now to their left is a very wide open flank. Basically nothing there. Behind them, to the left of the 9th Corps, 
is Marshall Messina's Fourth Corps, spread out along the road, Brighton Lee. We're not done yet because while they extend out this direction, they also are going to cut back towards the Danube. So there's cavalry and finally over to Aspern with the 4th Division. So that's a huge area that Marshall and his carriage is going to have to traverse to command his forces. And jumping to the south on the east side, that's the Bavarian Division of the 7th Corps in front of Grossenzerdorf there. Kind of see ourselves come back down to the crossing and some counters depicting the earthworks the Austrians had dug in the last month or so. Let's try to move ourselves down the river. There's Essling, some um, French cavalry there. North of Essling is Lagrange's division of the 4th Corps, so yet another 4th Corps unit spread out very thinly. Moving along to Aspern and the last French division. So that very thinly held French left is going to have to try to defend the river crossings from what really amounts to a pretty weak right-handed cross here by the by the Austrians. Since we play to win the game, how do we win this game? Well, the French certainly wanted this to be a battle that was decisive that could end the war, and the Austrians wanted to survive to sort of protect themselves and their monarchy. So the victory conditions really are representing this battle of annihilation. It's largely um, some geographic locations representing the French success in their attacks, as well as morale levels representing casualties inflicted. And largely it's about the French gaining ground and inflicting casualties and the Austrians kind of preventing that, escalating from marginal to decisive. I don't know that a decisive victory of that kind was really possible, but in game terms you can achieve it by capturing enough of the towns and inflicting enough casualties to drive enemy forces to morale levels. This game is really large and there's plenty of scenarios. It strikes me that there's opportunities for variance that you could create on your own if you're so inclined. One easy one is to kind of roll the clock back to 4 a.m. on July the 6th and let the Austrian attack try to play out. And you can have a variant where maybe they're a little more coordinated. They're able to attack on the left and the right. See if that can help the Austrians any. If you were really ambitious, you might roll the clock back to July the 4th. Start with the French crossings of the river. Maybe have them clear the, clear the crossings, fight their way across the Marchfeld. I don't know how fun that would be, but at least it'd be historical. You could also play with the forward Austrian defense, trying to defend the crossings rather than falling back immediately to the heights. Another what-if to consider is the battles in Italy. Maybe Eugene and John have more of a tussle. Maybe John does better. Maybe he prevents Eugene from joining the army. So maybe you could see what Wagram looks like without Eugene's army of Italy and Marmont's army of Dalmatia. And another variant I can think of, but I'm not inclined to try because it would require me to make counters, is there is one last Austrian corps that's just off the map to the left, the fifth corps. What if Charles was far more aggressive, and he committed that corps along with um, the others on the right in a really strong blow to go after those bridges. That could make for a really interesting fight along the French left, Austrian right. 
Of course, that is probably the biggest dismissal of history because Charles was in, in no way ever going to try that. But what the hell, it's a game. We've already dismissed, dismissed history because we're looking at paper and cardboard. So maybe it might be fun to give that a try. But scenario eight is ready to go, so there's nothing left to do but start pushing counters, see how this thing plays out. I'll check in with some updates from time to time, see how the battle develops. See if the Austrians can do a little better than they did historically. Though, actually now seeing the forces laid out on the map in a pretty faithful representation, that looks really, really unlikely. <laughs>